One thing that it is very important for us to know is how many pi electrons there are in the molecule. We need to know how many pi electrons there are in the molecule. How many pi electrons are there in acetylene? Well, the only pi electrons here are in the pi bond. Two electrons in the bond, so there are two pi electrons. Now, we need to place those two pi electrons in the pi molecular orbitals. So where should we put the pi electrons in the molecular orbitals? Well, let's place the first electron. Should we place it in the high energy level or the low? Well, I hope you know that we always, according to the alphabet principle, try to fill the lower energy levels first. So we'll put the first electron here in the lower energy. And where should I put the second electron? Also, in the lower energy level. There's no need to put any electrons in the high energy level because we only have two electrons here. So now we have our pi energy levels, and we've also shown all the pi electrons in this molecule. What, is, what do these little arrowheads mean? You might remember that electrons have spin, um, and that in each orbital we can fit two electrons, um, one with a spin going one way and the, another with a spin going the other way. Uh, we might call the spins up and down. Those don't really have any real physical meaning. Um, but we can say that this electron is spinning one way and this electron is spinning the other way. So remember that how many electrons can we fit in each orbital? Two. Each orbital can fit a maximum of two electrons, two electrons of opposite spin. Uh, we can fit a maximum of two electrons of opposite spin in each orbital. So this is all that we're really going to need to know about molecular orbitals to understand Huckel's rule. What do we need to be able to figure out? We need to be able to figure out how many pi molecular orbitals there are and what their energy levels are. And we need to be able to count how many pi electrons there are and which pi molecular orbitals those electrons are in. This is the type of sketch that we'll need to understand Huckel's rule. Let me remind you that we're only going to be drawing the pi molecular orbitals. Um, this molecule also has a bunch of sigma molecular orbitals, but we don't care about those. So we're not going to be paying attention to the sigma orbitals or the sigma electrons, only pi. Let's try to go through the same exercise for this molecule. Uh, so this is a three carbon molecule with a double bond, and this indicates an unpaired electron. So we have a carbon radical on this carbon at the right. This is a carbon radical. So try pausing the tape and try to write down the pi molecular energy levels and try then to put the pi electrons into the pi molecular orbitals. Give that a shot. Well, we have to count how many p orbitals there are. This carbon is sp2, so it has a p orbital. This carbon is sp2, so it has a p orbital. And this carbon is also sp2. Radicals are also sp2, using the rule for hybridization that we discussed at the beginning of the videos. This also has one p orbital. So we have three p atomic orbitals. How many pi molecular orbitals are we going to get? also three. That's conservation of orbitals. Since we're mixing three orbitals together, we get three pi molecular orbitals out. Remember that we're not going to bother um, showing what the orientation of the p orbitals are. We're not going to bother counting the nodes. We're not going to worry about the bonding and anti-bonding and non-bonding levels. We just need to know how many energy levels there are and where they are. But we do need now to put the pi electrons in. So how many pi electrons are there in this molecule? There's two pi electrons in the pi bond. And what is this carbon doing with its p orbital? It's putting its unpaired electron in its p orbital. So this also counts as a pi electron. Remember that the pi electrons are the electrons in the side-to-side -side overlapping p orbitals. 
these carbons are using their p orbitals for the pi bond, and this carbon will use its p orbital for the unpaired electron. So we have three pi electrons. Three pi electrons. So let's start placing them. I'll put the first electron here. By the way, it doesn't matter whether you show the first electron as having an upspin or a downspin. Either of those is fine. But if I show the first electron with an upspin, then the second electron has to have the downspin. So that also goes down here. Now, where am I going to put the third electron? Well, there's no room for it in the bottom orbital anymore. Remember that each orbital can only have a maximum of two electrons. So I'm going to have to put the third electron in this middle orbital over here. And that exhausts our pi electrons. So this is the complete diagram that we have to show, showing all the pi electrons and the energy levels for this molecule. One thing to notice here is that in this case, we now have an unpaired electron. Here we have an unpaired electron, which reflects the fact that this is a radical. Now, are unpaired electrons particularly stable or unstable? Well, I think that you should be familiar with the idea that unpaired electrons are highly unstable. It's much more stable to have all paired electrons than to have unpaired electrons. That's why radicals in general are thought of as unstable species. So I'll repeat that idea because that's going to be important as we move on. Uh, as we move on to understand Huckel's rule, the basis for understanding Huckel's rule is that having paired electrons is good, uh, but having unpaired electrons is bad. Unpaired electrons make the molecule unstable. Having all paired electrons makes the radical stable. That, again, is the basic reason why radicals tend to be unstable to start to apply these techniques we've been talking about to the types of molecules that we would use Huckel's rule on. Now remember that in order for a molecule to be aromatic or anti-aromatic, it has to be cyclic and completely conjugated. So from now on, we're going to be thinking about cyclic and completely conjugated molecules. Unfortunately though, um, the pi energy levels look different for a completely conjugated molecule than they do for the normal molecules we've been seeing so far. Um, so to repeat that again, if you have a cyclic, completely conjugated molecule, the pi, uh, the pi energy levels are drawn differently than we've been doing so far. So we're going to have to learn a new technique. How do we draw the pi energy levels for a cyclic, completely conjugated molecule? Well, we're going to use a trick that's called the Frost diagram. It's possible that you might have heard this diagram mentioned in your course. Let's try drawing the pi um, energy levels for this cyclic and completely conjugated molecule. And remember again that we're not going to be able to use the same techniques that we used for non-completely conjugated molecules. Instead, the technique that we're going to use is that we're going to draw one energy level at each vertex. We're going to draw one energy level at each vertex. That means one energy level at each corner. Well, this corner then I'm going to draw an energy level. This corner, here's an energy level. This corner, here's an energy level. And here's the energy level at the top corner. So this represents the pi energy levels for this cyclic and completely conjugated molecule. How many energy levels are there? Well, you can see there's four. Well, that's what we would have predicted anyway, because there's four p atomic orbitals, right? There's a p orbital here, 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 and here. Each of the four atoms has a p orbital. So we would have expected that we would get four molecular orbitals out. But what you might not have expected is that two of the orbitals are at the same energy level. Notice that these two middle orbitals, these two middle energy levels, they're both at the same energy level. That's what we would not have expected. Using the techniques we saw before, before when we saw p, uh, when we saw four p orbitals, we would just have drawn that as four separate levels. If you're not working with a cyclic, completely conjugated molecule, if you have four p orbitals, that just gives you four molecular orbitals all at their own levels. But it turns out that when you're cyclic and completely conjugated, not all of the levels um, are different from each other. Instead, some of the levels can be at the same at the same level. So here we have two molecular orbitals at the same level. By the way, uh, that 
uh, is referred to as degenerate. When you have two or more orbitals at the same level, if they have the same energy, we refer to those as degenerate levels. That's maybe a, an overly dramatic way of putting it, but we can say that this molecular orbital and this molecular orbital are degenerate. All that means is that they have the same energy level. So you can see we're drawing them at the same height on the blackboard. 